Good morning from Bonnie, Scotland. It's a lovely day and I guess I'm trying my best to do a Scottish brogue. It's a very hard, forceful language, but it's a very friendly language. So I'm here with Barry at the castle. This is Stirling Castle. I think I'm probably gonna drop that accent now. I gotta go too slow. Hi everyone, it's Rose McInerney. It is starting to rain in a few minutes here. I'm at a Stirling Castle and you can see the backdrop here, the gardens inside. This is probably the most pivotal, important castle or one of the most important castles in all of Scotland. It is where um, the greatest number of kings and queens were crowned. And of course, uh, this feeds into my story about Mary, Queen of Scots, who is our fallen woman uh, this week coming on womanscape.com on Wednesday. I've tried a number of times, had a few technical difficulties, had roaring wind and rain. So today is a, a calmer day and I'm just gonna give you a two minute little blurb about Mary, Queen of Scots. So what to know about Mary, you can read all about her this week on womanscape.com. But um, she's really a, an amazing woman and um, everyone um, still really, is fascinated by her. We saw just the latest movie um, from out of Hollywood at the beginning of July, I think it was out. Maybe it was a little earlier than that with Margot Robbie and Sorsa Ronan um, playing respectively Elizabeth I and Mary um, Stewart. So the story really with Mary Stewart is that she was born um, into royalty. Her father was James V and her mother was um, inherited the the crown um, uh, from or was in line for the throne for France. Her name is Mary of Guise, and Mary of Guise is a fascinating woman herself. Maybe we'll we'll study her at Womanscape at some point. Six foot two, very unusually tall, beautiful woman. At twenty six, she chose to marry um, James the fifth, knowing that she'd be coming to Scotland and living a very hard life. Her other offer of marriage, of course, was with Henry VIII, and she was smart enough to know that things didn't end well there. I think by that point, uh, Henry VIII had already married um, and either divorced or beheaded, um, uh, you know, his three former wives at that point. So, okay, back to Mary, Queen of Scots. So Mary was um, the child of James and Mary, um, born in 15, let's get this right, 1542. And six days after she was born, her father passed away. So she inherited the crown. Of course, her mother stayed in the castle at Sterling, actually. Um, so she stayed in the castle that James had built a beautiful, well, not built, but in, improved anyway. He'd spent hundreds of, of thousands of dollars on this castle to make it beautiful at the time. And that would be millions of dollars in today's uh, currency. So... Um, Mary was quickly whisked off to France and her mother sent her away to protect her. Um, there were always um, bids or, or people looking to take the throne. This was a tumultuous time for Scotland. Um, they had been warring, of course, with England for, for many, many years. And it was also a time of reformation. So uh, Mary was quickly whisked away for her own safety. Um, she was coronated uh, 10 months, nine or 10 months after her birth though. So she was the rightful heir to the throne. Okay, so uh, Mary is quickly sent off to France and she is sent there for two reasons. She is going to be promised um, in marriage to the Dauphin's uh, son. So Francis, she's gonna marry Francis. And um, so she's going to be raised in the, the uh, French way of princesses and educated in Latin and Greek and Italian and French and English um, and learn to ride horses and do tapestries and needlework and um, write and be skilled in poetry. So it's a, it's a great upbringing for Mary who um, turns into a beautiful, smart, very tall, lovely looking lady. Her mother holds the fort down until Mary is going to be old enough to come home and to rule um, and also probably just a waiting game because Henry VIII at this point has asked Mary of Guise, her mother, if she can um, have uh, Edward, Henry VIII's only son, be married to Mary and of course uh, Mary of Guise doesn't want anything to do with that so this offer by the French king is a good one so that's where Mary is she grows up at the age of 16 she is married off to Francis uh, and they're in love they really they really love each other um, he's a handsome fellow um, two years younger than she is actually um, so they do get married and over the course of I 
think just a little over a year, uh, Francis contracts an ear infection and the infection, he gets um, encep not encephalitis, but it, uh, the infection spreads to his brain and he dies. Um, so it's a rather rude and startling start to Mary. So she's pretty upset, of course. She goes back to join her mother, Mary of Guise, and her mother proceeds to pass away several months after that. So here is Mary. She's educated and bright, but she's left in a very precarious situation already. So how do the Scots feel? The Scots want to marry her off, and they'd like to marry her to a Protestant because the majority of Mary's uh, sort of ruling advisors and administrators are Protestant at this point. Um, so they're pushing for her to get married, and they also don't like the fact that it's a woman on the throne. They want a man to be running it. They don't feel that she's got the strength. Um, so Catholics and uh, Protestants are vying for certain things and really pushing against Mary. Mary makes a bad choice, probably. She says she marries for love, and she, uh, four years after she returns home to Scotland, she marries a fellow by the name of Lord Delaney. Lord Delaney is really kind of her half-cousin. Of course, that happened a lot with all these royals, and we know that throughout Europe, it's really like a Game of Thrones. Um, women are pawns. They are moved around the European board of power and married off in order for alliances to happen between nations. And um, so, of course, to strengthen the um, Scottish country, having a man on the throne, they think is going to be a good thing from a military perspective. If he's a par Protestant, it will also um, kind of calm the conflict between England and Scotland at this time as well. And I'll get into that in a second. But um, essentially, she makes this decision, marries Lord Delaney, who courts her and seems super nice and everything else. And as soon as they're married, things change drastically. And um, he's not the man that she thought uh, she was marrying. And he turns out to be very, very angry because she doesn't want to name the king right away. Doesn't seem to be a lot of love in the marriage. Um, She's got a close advisor named Riccio, and um, some speculate that Riccio actually and her um, did go to bed, and that the next heir to the throne of both Scotland and England, who is um, James the Sixth, is actually the son of Riccio and not Lord Delaney. Um, you know, no proof of that, and of course the crowns wouldn't want to touch it anyway. It's convenient; they want to have a male heir anyway. Um, but unfortunately, Delaney gets very jealous of her relationship with Riccio and he murders um, Riccio right in front of um, poor Queen Mary. Um, she's five months pregnant. Some say that was done so that she would lose the baby because he was that angry and others just say he lost it. He just lost it. So um, the Scottish people aren't happy with Lord Delaney though. They, they weren't happy from the very beginning and they're still not happy. And so someone sets an explosion um, within a year and Lord Delaney is killed. Um, and the crazy thing about that death is that he's not killed in an explosion so that we're not sure what happened, but actually he manages to escape the explosion and he's found with marks around his neck, so he's been strangled. So lots of intrigue with Mary's life. Um, and I think that's one of the things that makes her so riveting. So what follows after this um, marriage is really her looking to court and get married again. But within a year, actually, um, Queen Elizabeth is getting nervous. And I mentioned I'd come back to Queen Elizabeth. So um, Mary, quite rightfully, was the senior heir to the throne after the death of Henry VIII. Um, Mary, Queen of, of, of England, the one who took the throne, was his um, first daughter. She deserved that throne first before Mary, Queen of Scots. But when Elizabeth the I took the throne, Many people argue that Mary of Scotland was more deserving. She was more senior. She, um, for so many reasons, but we don't need to get into that. So anyway, so Elizabeth I is getting nervous about Mary, Queen of Scots as well, because now there's an heir to the throne. He's born, the baby is born, and Elizabeth is worried about whether or not he can challenge now um, the throne, um, as well as still the constant chatter about whether or not Elizabeth even belongs there. So as a result, some um, English troops um, come to capture uh, Mary, and she's taken prisoner, even though she puts up a, a good, she gets a, a group of 6,000 um, uh, men together um, to try to resist it. But she goes willingly, and for the next 20 years, she's basically captured, escapes once from Castle Loch Lemon, um, but then is captured again. 
Um, so over the course of this time, um, she's living somewhat comfortably. She just can't leave without permission. Um, and so in the end, eventually, um, Queen Elizabeth is gets very, very nervous and decides, you know, to go, agree and follow what her Privy Council suggests. And she signs a warrant for the execution of Mary. Um, again, some controversy, whether or not she really ever intended that to be put into effect is, is one story. The other is that she did it and she knowingly had her executed several months later in 1587 so that she'd put an end to this um, concern about her rule. So Mary at this time too was forced to turn over her son just after she was captured. Um, she was forced to turn over her son and abdicate the throne. So actually at this point now it's James the sixth, her son, who's the rightful heir to the throne of Scotland. So perhaps there was an idea by Elizabeth that she could go ahead and take Scotland forcefully while uh, the heir to the king of the throne was, was young and um, she was still able to defeat him. So who knows what the truth was, um, but Mary did go to her death. Um, she was guillotined. Um, of course, she was very prayerful and there's all kinds of famous um, sort of sayings about, you know, what she said when she appeared um, in front of the court. She wore the, the um, crimson, the red colors of a... Um, a Catholic martyr and in fact the guillotines at that time were poorly poorly constructed so there's horrific stories that in fact the guillotine they tried four times to to kill her and it didn't work until the fifth time so she really really suffered and that's really what you'll read about um, on womanscape.com is a little bit about all of this sort of the legacy but also just the suffering and how difficult it was for a woman to rule then um, you know, and I don't know how different it is today. You'd like to think that it's better. Of course, we've got Queen Elizabeth II, the longest ruling uh, monarch ever in the history of the world. Um, and she seems to be doing fine. She's had her ups and downs, um, but it's been really interesting. People have pushed and, and wondered when was, you know, Philip or when was, you know, Charles, her son, going to take over or not? Was it because she was a woman? Did they think her ineffective? Um, a lot of these lessons about monarchs and women ruling can be translated into the business world maybe too and what it takes for a woman to rule um, and be treated, um, you know, be taken seriously and not dependent on the man that she's married to. So that's about it for Mary. Uh, Take care, everyone. <laughs> it didn't rain. Bye for now.